It's the Matt Sager Podcast, Thursday, October 25th, and yes, I've heard you. I understand you want me to begin recapping Daredevil Season 3, and I'm all too happy to oblige. What, you think I don't like recapping TV? Perhaps you missed the last six or seven Tuesdays of this podcast in which I've recapped Better Call Saul. With that show over, I frankly was itching for a new TV show to begin recapping, and the requests for Daredevil Season 3 recaps have been just flooding in. Which is interesting to me because I would think as Daredevil fans who are eager to know what's going on with Daredevil, you'd be watching the show. But maybe you're just interested in my take on it. Maybe you can't pirate Netflix anymore and had been doing so successfully for a while and you no longer have that password or who knows what. Whatever reason you've been making these requests, it's been music to my ears, even though it's been in writing. It's going to be a pleasure for me to recap this excellent show for you. And after tonight, when I get my voice all the way back, it'll be even more pleasant for you to hear. But in the meantime, Daredevil's going to do some of the heavy lifting for my voice, which is still a little bit Scott Ferrelli. Oh, man, shake it up, shake it up. I'm the man, you're the man. So we begin with the aftermath of the Defenders. Actually, in particular, we begin with the final scene of the Defenders. This is all in the previously on Daredevil. Because, in fact, the incident from which we're picking up did not happen in Daredevil Season 2, but in the final episode of The Defenders. So, spoiler alert if you haven't watched Daredevil Seasons 1 and 2, and also if you haven't watched The Defenders. That having been said, we open with an explosion, with Matt, Daredevil, and Elektra caught in an exploding and collapsing skyscraper. I'm gonna die here. This is what leaving feels like. Living does sometimes feel like you're living through a building explosion, but I think Elektra's idea of living is a bit extreme, and for Matt, it leaves him mortally wounded. The fact that he's alive at all is, frankly, a miracle, which leads into the title of this episode, Resurrection. It's also the theme. From the very first moment, this is all about getting back to where you once belonged. In the case of Daredevil, he's found bleeding, now deaf in one ear, just a wreck. He looks dead. A homeless person thinks that he's actually a dead person and is just going to lift his wallet. But instead, Daredevil says, no, 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 take me to the church. I need to see Father Lantham. And so when Matt wakes up, still in all kinds of shock, still reeling from his injuries, which really should have killed him, there's this opening sequence in which you get to watch him suffer the effects of the explosion. It is quite dramatic and looks like nothing short of torture. And it really is just, you know, this is superhero stuff. A regular person in this kind of explosion would simply be dead. If you went through something like this and ended up just being deaf in one ear and needing to see a doctor, you would be down on your hands and knees praising and thanking whichever deity you worship. In the case of Matt Murdock, that is, of course, Catholicism. And as such, he finds himself back at the orphanage where he grew up. Talking about getting back to where he once belonged, Matt is right back to where it all began for him. After his father died and he was left orphaned, blind, and ostensibly handicapped, although what he was really dealing with was the overwhelming amount of all his other senses and his inability to control his powers. So he was suffering quite a bit, but eventually made pretty good in the orphanage and then left to pursue a law career and be a vigilante by night. And now where is he? He's right back in the orphanage, a bit old for it now, but in the care of Father Lantum and in particular of the nun Sister Maggie who takes no guff and does not suffer fools like Matt is currently being gladly, but who's very interested in Matt, in his powers and his experiences and in what he's seen and done in the world. She is fascinated by him, even as she's concerned by and for him. Things I've heard you can do. You are blind, right? You were just faking it the whole time. Congratulations. Finally caught me. It's not a fair question. Yeah, the accident blinded me. Just also uh, sharpened my other senses. Not to worry, sister. Those days are behind me. Yeah, the days of being Daredevil are apparently behind him. He neither wants nor is apparently able to go back into combat and action. And to be fair, he's not only wallowing here. He's also dealing with the reality that he's, in addition to being blind, now half deaf. How many senses is this poor man going to lose in pursuit of justice, in pursuit of this vengeance he still carries in his heart for the father that he lost, in trying to weed out crime and corruption from New York City, whether it be in the form of Wilson Fisk 
or the hand or whatever criminal element is currently making New York City uninhabitable, dangerous. By day, he wears one suit and fights for people who've been injured in industrial accidents or who've suffered at the hands of nasty manufacturers, chemical companies, and what have you. And then at night, he's been putting on the other suit and going after people like Wilson Fisk, taking on the hand, and whichever villain the Avengers are not currently handling, or that Luke Cage and Iron Fist weren't dealing with up till now. With both Luke Cage and Iron Fist now having been canceled and are off Netflix, that means Matt is really going to have his hands full if in fact he does put the red suit back on. Because the criminals are not being canceled, they're not taking any vacations, and they're not wallowing in their emotional and physical injuries at the orphanage in which they grew up. Now, yes, of course, Jessica Jones is still around and kicking lots of ass, and I hope that she will be renewed for a third season. But let's face it, Hell's Kitchen needs its guardian devil, which means he's got to get his act together. Whether that's even possible, whether he has the will to try and see that through, that's what we need to know. But as of now, in talking about where he's been and where he's going with Sister Maggie, he is quite definitively saying that the devil has hung up his horns. That life of action and pursuing justice regardless of the physical and emotional cost, it's behind him now. Pretty banged up. Your spine, your hip. Well, the days of doing backflips might be over, but you'll get back on your feet. And now that you're out of the woods, you want me to go? It's not a convalescent home. I understand. I'm sorry. I'll figure something out. There must be at least one person I can call for you. No. There's no one. Yeah, he wants to leave not only the life of Daredevil behind him, but seemingly the life of Matt Murdock. And now he's been practically excommunicated. He's been kicked out of the orphanage that he once called home and that he thought he might be able to call home again. And he's instead consigned to the basement of the church, where he continues to wallow and really make an ass of himself as he becomes defined by his injuries and his handicaps. And as he continues to turn his back not only on justice, but on the basics of humanity. Doesn't want his friends to know that he's alive. Doesn't want to leave the church. Doesn't want to try. He says he's not Matt Murdock anymore, but he's certainly not Daredevil either. And both Matt and Daredevil are being sorely missed by the people he's left behind so cruelly. Foggy Nelson, his partner and best friend. And of course, Karen Page, now a journalist, who is doggedly determined that A, Matt is still alive, and B, she will find him and help him recuperate. Foggy is less convinced, but they commiserate together, going through his old apartment. Karen looks at the closet where his costume used to be when he first told her that he was Daredevil and he showed her his secret hiding place for the costume. She looks and sees that the trunk is now empty, and like Matt, the costume is gone. She's not willing to give up, but Foggy's taking a more realistic tack. The building fell on Matt, a big one, and nobody's heard from him since. Matt's dead. The first time I've said that out loud. I don't want to accept it either. You know, what kind of hero does that to his friends? Granted, this is all about resurrection, which means before he gets to heaven, he's got to go through hell. But why he feels the need to put his friends through it? That is what happens when we get depressed and we're cut off from what makes us us. We don't want to be around friends. That is one of the many things that you don't see portrayed properly when people talk about and pretend they have PTSD, either in the pages of comics or on film, as I've been talking about a lot lately. They miss a lot of the real symptoms of PTSD, what it really does to you. It makes you not want your loved ones to see you because there's something wrong with you and you can't be saved. But it puts them through hell and it means you're being a little bit selfish and rather unheroic if you don't mind me being a bit judgmental for a moment. And frankly, I think it's okay. I think we have carte blanche to judge a man who once was a superhero protecting the streets of New York and is now hiding in the basement of a church saying he's no longer a superhero. He's also no longer Matt Murdock keeping his friends in the dark and keeping himself very much in the dark. That's not a blind joke. He's down in the basement. That's about as dark and gloomy as it gets. And he goes so far as to compare himself to Sister Maggie, of all people, to someone who suffered consequences of literally biblical proportions. There is a man from the land of Uz. The Book of Job. The Book of Job. Story of God's perfect servant, Job. He prayed every day at dawn with his knees on the ground, his face in the dirt. Slaughtered ten goats, one for each of his children, and burned them at the altar in God's honor. 
Of all God's soldiers, Joe, he was the most loyal. I know the story, Matthew. Oh, then you know what happens next. God murdered all ten of his children in cold blood. Scorched every inch of Job's land, lashed at his body till his skin was covered in bloody welts. Now, to be fair, Matt has literally just survived an explosion. The opening sequence of this episode is Matt falling through the flames, his body being battered and destroyed, and he's now left a shell of himself. On the one hand, that comes out in his emotions and his actions, but also physically what he's been through would leave anyone devastated and unable to function. But to compare yourself to Job while you're on consecrated holy ground and speaking with a nun, that might be going a bit far. Even with all that Matt has been through, as far as Sister Maggie's concerned, that just might be a bridge too far to compare oneself to Job. God rains shit and misery on the life of his most perfect servant and still. Job would not curse him. You know what I realized? Job was a pussy. You see, that was me, sister. I suffered willingly. I gave my, uh, sweat and blood and skin without complaint because I, I too, believed I was God's soldier. So he's certainly cast off the identity of Matt Murdock, even though he has yet to take on the identity of Daredevil again. He's a man with nothing, and he is really leaned into this whole self-pity thing, which, again, I totally get. Listen, if I'm ever in an explosion of any kind, you will find me curled up in a ball someplace completely dysfunctional. If I stub my toe, that will make me an unpleasant person to be around for most of the day. So sure, going through that explosion would leave anyone quite banged up, emotionally and spiritually as well as physically. But this is a hero we're talking about. And yes, maybe that responsibility is too much for anyone, but as far as Sister Maggie is concerned, this guy's hanging out in the basement of her church, comparing himself to Job, saying, I'm not Daredevil anymore, I'm not Matt Murdock anymore, just leave me to suffer. Just being, to be perfectly frank, a diva. And she's not having it. You might hate God right now, but the feeling is not mutual. No, I don't hate him. I've just seen his true face is all. And for the record, I had friends. I had a life. I care about people, and I'm choosing to let them believe that I'm gone because I am. I'm not Joe. And I know my truth now. What truth? Well, that in front of this God, I'd rather die as the devil than live as Mount Murdoch. This is a man in desperate need of resurrection. To say that it's better to reign in hell than to suffer on this mortal plane, which is basically what he just said. This guy is in desperate need of some spiritual and physical healing. The physical is going to be a realm unto itself and a miracle if it happens at all. But first, he's got to get off his ass, stop with the pity for half a second, and think about the world around him and what, if any, is his place in all of it. And speaking of, maybe his prime motivator, quite possibly the reason he put on the suit to begin with, the man who he is diametrically opposed to, the most corrupt and hateful individual in all of New York City, Wilson Fisk. What's up with that guy? Well, the amazing Vincent D'Onofrio. This D'Onofrio has had enough Rio! Who, among other things, you might remember from his excellent appearance on the season four premiere of BoJack Horseman. But you probably know him best, especially if you're listening to recaps of Daredevil, as Wilson Fisk. And what is he up to? He's in the slammer. He's refused to talk and refused to cooperate with the feds. But that might change because love changes a man. So when he meets with his lawyers and gets some unpleasant news, some very disturbing news, he may just have to make some changes of his own. Your appeal is proceeding as discussed. News. That implies new information. Let's start there. We'll remind you we're only the messengers. We've been doing everything we can to help her. But there have been some setbacks regarding Miss Mariana's return. It's going to be more complicated than we anticipated. How so? 
The federal government has decided to charge her as an accessory. If they locate her overseas or she sets foot on U.S. soil, she'll face prosecution and prison. See. Leave. Yeah, he is very unhappy to hear that the love of his life, Vanessa, who he has sent on the run for her own protection, is refusing to cooperate and to obey him. That is, of course, one of the main attributes that made him fall so deeply in love with her to begin with, that she could not be bullied, could not be cowed into submission by him, that she was every bit as strong-willed as he was, if not more so. And unlike Matt Murdock, who is currently hiding from his friends and loved ones, Wilson wants nothing more than to know that Vanessa is safe, to hold on to the notion that he might one day be reunited with her, and that she will remain alive and well. That is all he cares about, is the love of his life. Whereas Daredevil is back in the church, no longer in the orphanage, but being every bit the brat he was when he inhabited it, if not more so. And Maggie has had it up to here with him. She's not taking any more of this. What you said about rather dying as the devil than living as Matt Murdock. I just want you to know that I think you're a hero hiding down here feeling sorry for yourself. Let me just step back. There's an orphanage full of kids who've lost everything and everyone. Some of them disabled, much worse off than you ever were. And they're still trying to make the most out of life, the little coward. Okay, all right. And here you are with all the gifts God gave you. Handsome, smart, a law degree, and people who care about you. Yeah. And you're bravely giving up. Well, you know, thank you for the tough love, sister. And your charmingly simplistic view of God and the world. Look, I, I appreciate everything you've done for me, I really do, but don't for a second think you know anything about me or my life. Yeah, the fact that Matt is facing a life in which he can no longer fight crime has clearly broken him. He is now wallowing all the way, turning away not only his friends and loved ones like Karen and Foggy, but people who really care for him, who are caring for him in the moment, like Sister Maggie. I've been a nun for 30 years. I know self-pity when I hear it. Okay, good. Your father was famous around here. I saw him fight. I saw him go down many times, but he never stayed down. And Maggie just hit Matt where it hurts. She knows his soft spot, and she went right for it. That is Daredevil's kryptonite, his father and what happened to him. And the example that he set for Matt, always fighting, always standing up for the little guy, never staying down no matter how hard you've been hit. That breaks through Matt's fog doesn't magically restore his hearing, doesn't heal his physical wounds, but stirs something deep inside his soul, turns him back around, makes him remember what his mission is in life, to fight for the helpless, to champion those in need, to always be true to himself and his beliefs and his values and his endless quest for justice. And so after stewing on what Sister Maggie's told him and in remembering himself and finally getting back to who he really is inside and understanding that things may be very bleak and he may never recover, but he's still Matt. He still cares about people and he still needs to be as much of a warrior as he can be under these circumstances. And so alone in the church basement, Matt begins training, just like he did in his youth, long before he ever put on the daredevil suit, when all he did was go out at night and fight for the helpless. He's going to get back in fighting trim if it's at all possible. What in God's name? Feel that? Feel what? Three subway lines run beneath us. At any given time, there are six different trains vibrating the ground. That was the U-train. What was it now? You brought food. I did. I brought you some Beef ravioli from Nona's. Nice. Now you're just showing off. It is funny that as soon as she mentions his father and he gets to training, the first thing he does is set up a bag so he can do some boxing. Because his dad was battling Jack Murdoch, the boxer who never stayed down, who never surrendered, who always kept fighting no matter what the cost was, all the way up till the end when he paid the ultimate price. Can Matt honestly do any less and call himself a hero? And in so doing, after doing some boxing and getting back into fighting shape, sure, he's still half deaf and, of course, completely blind, but his other senses are really coming back to him. He's bragging about the smells and tastes 
and feeling the walls. He can tell you which subway line is running underneath. He's beginning to resemble Matt Murdock once more. It's about time, too, I should say. Matt, meanwhile, continues training in the church basement. He goes so far as to get Sister Maggie and Father Lantum to bring him a sparring partner against whom he can box, and who he puts up a great fight against. But this is not what you would expect. This isn't Daredevil against a civilian and just kicking the guy's ass. It's a man barely holding his own, a guy who's showing a remarkable amount of strength and endurance when you consider what he's just been through. But he is not Daredevil right now. He's trying but he doesn't even beat this guy in the church basement. Comes very close, and yet he still feels compelled. He knows that there are people out there in the dark at night who are helpless and in danger. And so he puts on an all-black bodysuit, a makeshift black helmet-slash-mask that he wraps around his face like a bandana, and which covers his eyes. An excellent way of masking one's identity, and of course, a very appropriate costume for a man who has no eyesight. And he catches a group of thugs attempting to mug a woman, and he does swoop down and save her, and he puts up a very good fight against these punks. But it's ultimately a fight he loses, and when he finally does... Before they leave him in the alley to just bleed out and eventually be found by the police or paramedics, he throws one of them a pipe and just waits for the guy to come. And it looks like he wants the guy to just beat the hell out of him. I'm not sure if this is some ritual Catholicism thing or whether he had a plan in mind. This is very possible to snatch the pipe, regain the upper hand in the fight and beat the thugs into submission. But it's all broken up when the cops show up and the thugs run away just before they start beating on Matt like... I mean, this could have ended very badly for him. But they hear the sirens and run away. And although we don't see it, all we see is the cop car pulling up. But by the time it's made its way up a few feet to the scene of the crime, Matt is no longer on the floor kneeling. He's done the old Batman rooftop Commissioner Gordon trick where you just disappear. No one knows how, why, or where you went. So he's not back on his feet in many ways. But he's got his mission back, and that means a lot. His resurrection has officially begun. But back to Wilson Fisk for a moment. This D'Onofrio has had enough Rio. Yes, he has not been talking to the feds yet, but this news about Vanessa has really changed something deep inside of him. Just like Matt, he's going through a transformation. And so it is that we meet FBI Special Agent Ray Nadim, who is having some financial difficulties which have been making his job at the FBI very hard. And in addition, he's been working the crummiest detail that they have at the Bureau. He's been making the routine visits to Fisk in his jail cell, trying to see if he can get any information out of him. And Fisk, being Fisk, has been all about loyalty, power, An obstinate, stubborn refusal to talk to anyone or give up anything. He's the kingpin for crying out loud. But now, with Vanessa in danger and a change needing to be made, because he's got to be the one now to rescue her. She's not following his instructions, so he's got to save her himself. And so Agent Nadim goes to see him, and maybe this time things will be a little bit different with Fisk. Let's see. Mr. Fisk, I'm Special Agent Marie Nadim with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The FBI... I would like your assistance with... <sighs> Let's just cut to a part where you tell me to eat shit so we can stop wasting each other's time, huh? Tell me, Special Agent Nadim. Do you have anyone in your life who you love so much you'd do anything to protect them? Are you threatening me? That's right, Wilson Fisk, the kingpin of crime, arch-rival of Daredevil, criminal kingpin of New York City and perhaps much of the world, he has been beaten by love and he is ready to do what was previously unthinkable. He too has been resurrected. I would do anything to protect her. Anything. I'm sorry. What is it you're saying? I want to make a deal. That's major. When you think about everyone that Wilson Fisk knows, the number of names of big fish he can give the FBI, as nasty and horrible of a criminal as he is, this is what they've been praying for. He can give them everybody. There's no criminal who Wilson Fisk can't point out to the FBI. 
as an informant, he is just the most valuable asset imaginable, and he's just given himself up to the FBI. Because that's what love does to you sometimes. Makes you question your values and rearrange your priorities. And just like Matt, Wilson Fisk is really changing his views on life, the world, and his place in it. And on that note... That is Daredevil Season 3, Episode 1, Resurrection. I'll get to Episode 2 very shortly. In the meantime, hit me up with more requests for recaps or questions about anything you like. Perhaps you'd like to be a guest on the show, a participant. For whatever reason you'd like to get in touch, feel free to do so. It's matt at mattsager.com if you want to send an email. You can also call me at 646-535-4788 and reach me by social media. On Twitter, I'm at Matt Sager. On Instagram, it's Real Matt Sager. Facebook is The Matt Sager, where I also have a voiceover page, Matt Sager VO. And this podcast page is Matt Sager Podcast. You can also check out my Patreon. I've got some rewards up there, and I'd be very interested in hearing from you about ideas for other rewards. But do check out the page. It's patreon.com slash Matt Sager. And for more social media links and my articles and blog posts, my voiceover reels, contact information, all kinds of stuff. Check out my website, mattsagervoiceover.com. 